Good morning. We're continuing our series on miracles on a Saturday morning. I want to start by telling you some miracles that have happened right throughout the history of the church. So in fourth century, the great church father Augustine had been someone who had disparaged the idea of God healing in his day. But he changed his mind, and in his book, The City of God, which I haven't read, but in the book, The City of God, it says, or he writes, it's only two years ago that we began keeping records here in Hippo, and already at the time of writing, we have seen over 70 attested miracles. In the 18th century, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, was going along on his horse, and his horse became lame. He prayed for that horse, and immediately the horse got up and walked without so much as a limp. Luther, the great reformer in the 1500s, had not believed that miracles were for his day. Then his friend Philip Melanchthon became ill, seriously ill, dangerously ill. He went to see his friend and was prompted to write on the friend's wall the words of Psalm 118 verse 17, I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Immediately, Melanchthon began to show visible signs of improvement, and Luther credited this as a miracle. I've been reading the book of Acts recently, and one of the things that I have to question is, to what extent should we expect the miracles of the book of Acts today? Um, this is the question we're looking at this morning. Should we expect such miracles today? Is the book of Acts, on one hand, a template for the church? And we should say we should look like that and be a New Testament church. Or is the book of Acts exceptional, unique to the founding of the church, and we should expect something different? On one hand, you could argue that we are both post-Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is being poured out. So we can expect the Holy Spirit to do now what he did then. On the other hand, there are unique things about the book of Acts, particularly the focus on the apostles. Remember in Acts chapter 2, when it describes the church, it talks about the apostles performing miracles. They clearly had a unique role and unique ability in the church. So when I read, for example, of Peter, or was it Paul, and his how his handkerchief, that he touched handkerchiefs and people were healed, well, I don't expect that for me today. The apostles did have a unique function in God's plan. So in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 we read of the foundation of the church being laid by the apostles and prophets. But we need to be careful. Just because there's a uniqueness about the book of Acts does not mean that miracles have stopped. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 the apostle Paul is writing to the church and he talks about gifts of healings workings of miracles. James writes to the church and says if you're sick you should get the elders of the church to pray with you and have an expectation that you will be healed. One strange thing is that in the New Testament itself miracles and times of miracles are not actually uniform. We have in the book of Acts a summary of what took place over many years. We don't know what happened every day it's interesting that in Acts chapter 20, Paul can raise Eutychus from the dead, but at the end of his ministry in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 20, he's not able to heal Trophimus, his friend, and leave some ill at Miletus. I don't think it was a lack of faith on Paul's part that caused him not to be able to heal Trophimus. I think that God, in his sovereignty, is allowed to choose when and how he works. Sometimes and in some places he chooses to work miracles. Other times he chooses not to. Sometimes he answers our prayers the way we would like him to. Other times, like the thorn in the flesh, he says to Paul, no, I have a different plan. When someone has a miracle, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily more spiritual than others. When a church isn't experiencing miracles, it doesn't mean that they're le necessarily less spiritual. We have to allow God be in charge of when and when he doesn't um, 
give miracles to the church. One thing, though, I think is worth noting, and that is that it would seem, even in the book of Acts, that God does miraculous things, particularly on the frontier of mission. So, for example, as the church has grown in China in the last number of years, people have seen many miracles. John Stott points this out. He writes this, especially on the frontier of missions, when a power encounter may need to be necessary to demonstrate the Lordship of Christ, miracles have been, in, in, uh, have been and are being reported. I wonder as our society becomes more secular, people become more cynical, whether God will break into our society by increasing the number of miracles in his compassion to wake people up. I want to finish with another story of a miracle. Listen to this. In the 1930s, a poor carpenter in the mountains of Romania prayed the following prayer. My God, I have served you on earth and I wish to have my reward on earth as well as in heaven. And my reward should be that I should not die before bringing a Jew to Christ because Jesus was of the Jewish people. But I am poor, old and sick. I cannot go around and seek a Jew. In my village there are none. Bring to my village a Jew that I may bring him to Christ, uh, that I will do my best to bring him to Christ. God heard that prayer and graciously answered. A young Jewish man who had become an atheist was passing through some spiritual turmoil. He found himself thinking about the God that he said he did not believe in. He would pass by churches and feel compelled to go in. Then something drew him to the carpenter's village. I have no reason, or he says, I had no reason to go there. Romania had 12,000 villages, but I went to this one. The carpenter courted me as never a beautiful girl has been quartered, he said. He saw the young Jewish man as his answer to his prayer and gave him a Bible to read. The Bible he gave me was written not so much with words, but in flames of love that were fired by his prayers. I could barely read it. I could only weep over it, comparing my bad life with the life of Jesus, my impurity with his righteousness, my hatred with his love, and accepted me as one of his own. That young Jew was Richard Wormbrandt, the writer of the book Tortured for Christ, who would go on to be one of the most celebrated Christians of the 20th century. Let's pray that God would give us encounters with people that we could share the gospel with them.